And when I was with Lead Propeller, I was only getting like one new uh, buyer's list lead every week or mm-hmm. so. I don't know, maybe a couple a week. And then literally, with it, this didn't have anything to do with like posting more properties. When I switched to the Carrot site, it was like three to five every day. Hey guys and gals, this is Trevor with the Carrot Cast, and uh, I've got something really, really awesome and new for you. And this is this is like a Carrot Cast first, okay? So Luke Harris, our guest today, and I'll, I'll introduce you guys to Luke. He's the first and only person who has ever, ever signed up for Carrot walking into our office here in Rosemary, Oregon, walking into our doors. And uh, it was really cool to kind of talk through that story. But the reason he's on the Carrot cast is because of what he's doing on the land side of things. And uh, just some quick little snippets. Uh, looking at his account earlier today, he's got thousands of leads in there. So we'll kind of talk about some of the things he's doing on the land side. And uh, where he's living, what his business looks like now, what he's doing online to generate the, the leads, and also why he's working on land. So, uh, Luke, welcome to the Carrot Cast, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, dude. So it's kind of fun. I'd, I'd love to before we dive into your story and stuff. I'd love, love to kind of recap how we first connected. And dude, how how was it? Did you reach out to me directly? I can't remember that first contact specifically. Um. So I believe I first met you. I knew about you through a number of people in Roseburg there. Mm-hmm. Um. But I came to the Young Entrepreneur Society meeting. Yep. I think that's where I met you the first time. And Yep. I didn't even actually know what Carrot was then. I was using one of your competitors, and we started talking about it, and I was like, oh, wow, this is like exactly what I use. Yeah. Who uh, who were you using at that time? Lead Propeller. Mm-hmm. So you're at our Young, Young Entrepreneur Society meetup, and then, yeah, I can't remember that. Um, the next interaction, you learn about what we were doing, and the, then you reached out. And one, one thing that was really interesting with it too, because this is something that we all do as entrepreneurs, right? Where, of course, our pricing is, is higher than most of our competitors, so that was something we were chatting about. And, and um, I'm like, man, if, 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 if I can only get him to see the value and the extra performance he's gonna get, the extra 50 bucks a month or whatever it is, like, wouldn't even matter. So I'm going, man, what can I do? Just like proof is in the pudding kind of thing. And we're gonna talk about how we did that here in a bit. But uh, that's always going through my mind. I'm like, man, I know our craft. We know it better than anyone else. I'm confident about it. And then when we can like show it and prove it to people, then you really see the extra 50 or 100 bucks a month is like, it's actually costing you way more than that not to come over and work with something that's higher performing, for mm-hmm. sure. So let's kind of d- attack, uh, dive into your story, man. So first of all, where are you living now? Um, and also, what do you do for your business? Like, what, what's your primary focus? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm living in Virginia right now. Um, I'm actually not doing the land flipping full time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a forester, which uh, the reason I got into it originally is into land or real estate at all is I want to have a land base of timber properties mm-hmm. um, as like passive investment and to manage long term. So that's kind of what got me into it. Yep. Um, and the types of properties I'm doing right now are much smaller and they're not really timber properties, but, um, but I'm using it to build up capital to buy, uh, some larger deals. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, and pretty much all the, the land flippings out in Oregon, um, right now. So, so dude, how, how'd you originally get into land? Like, did, did you first get into real estate investing with houses or was it mainly from the timber side? Then you're like, okay, I'm going to do smaller batches of land. Kind of where did the land start come from? Um, yeah, it was essentially, uh, so our business is called the farm finders, which I think we might rebrand that. But the original idea was we're both me and my wife are into like alternative agriculture and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And of course I'm a forester. So, um, raw land made a lot of sense because it's, you know, everybody needs a parcel of land if you're going to farm or, Mm -hmm. uh, grow trees or something like that. So, um, and we had trouble you know, being able to get land inexpensively. And so I basically just started Googling, you know, how do I get cheap land? And Mm -hmm. some of the, there's several educators out there um, that teach, you know, flipping land. So a couple of those came up. I started listening to podcasts. That was probably early 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About a year and a half ago. Um, And then ended up buying one of the education programs and uh, diving in and getting started. So sweet. Which, uh, which coaches you end up working with on that? 
Uh, so there's Seth Williams is okay. who I originally started with, and cool. then um, Land Academy I went to after that. Uh, so those are the two. Sweet, and yeah, they're they're both solid, man. Which obviously shows in the results you're getting, which is cool. So kind of let, let's give people context right now. So that's kind of what originally got the mindset going and got you starting in looking for this stuff. You, you dove down the education path. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna dive into how you close your first land deal here in a bit. But kind of where are you now with it? So you're a year and a half in. Um, uh-huh. Kind of what type of consistency are you seeing with your land deals, and are they all in Oregon or are you else, elsewhere too? Yeah, so at the beginning, I kind of was spread out and we were thinking, oh, we'll do Virginia and Oregon. I'm from Virginia, my wife is from Oregon. Mm -hmm. Um, And I did a few deals like in North Carolina at the beginning and um, I don't know, they didn't go quite as well and I'm not sure exactly why, but it ended up we just decided to focus down in Oregon because that's Mm -hmm. where I think we're gonna end up Mm -hmm. long-term and not spread ourselves too thin and try to learn different markets and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, but right now, as far as consistency, we're doing three to five deals a month, um, pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we've done a total of around, right around 50 altogether this year. I think we did six or seven in the last few months of 2016 and then about 45 deals this year, something like that. So. That's exciting, dude. Like, I I, yeah. I love I love hearing stuff like that because you're at a point where you're seeing consistency, right? And I know it's something I preach a lot that in some of my previous businesses, you know, you don't really get to unlock what entrepreneurship has for you until you can start to get some sort of consistency because you're always in this boom and bust business model. And mm-hmm. um, you know, we all have some room to grow there, and we all have some work to to go and add more consistency to our business model, but. Uh, once you can start to get every deal you're clo- or every month you're closing a deal, and then every you know two weeks or whatever it is, man, the consistency adds up. So, how'd you get the first deal done? Uh, so I started, um, like I said, or I, I can't remember what I said, but in North Carolina is where I did my first couple of deals. Yep. Uh, so for lead generation, I pretty much exclusively done uh, direct mail mm-hmm. um, and I started mailing back tax properties first. Um, it took a while to get my first deals. I'm not sure exactly what was going wrong with my first, um, kind of using some different principles and stuff. Now I was sending out postcards and then I switched to like a whole offer with the price in it and gotcha. uh, it seems to work better and it's a different market too. But um, so the first deal I bought, I think it was in June or July um, $800 for a 0.8 acre parcel, I think it was in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, took a really long time to sell. It was like HOA fees, I think <laughs> might have been. I'm not sure what it was, but um, I finally sold it uh, like a year later. Oh, wow. Um, so my first couple deals really did not do very well at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second one was also in North Carolina. That one did a little bit better. I made some money on it, but it still took a long time to sell. Gotcha. Uh, and then I switched to Oregon and started using um, like a whole offer with a letter and like uh, an actual contract mm-hmm. that they, you know, people, a lot of the time people just sign it and send it back and never call, never email or anything. Um, so I started doing that and the deals just started coming in um, really consistently. Um, and so, and my first six deals, uh, I did like a several of them in in Eastern Oregon. I did a couple in like Lane County. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were really good deals. I want to start yeah. uh, getting into that market some more. But I did the ones in Lane County were really good. I did um, some one or two acre properties. Bought one for ten, sold it for twenty. Bought one for five and sold it for eleven. And those sold like instantly Sweet. like within a day I, I guess it's like the demand there is so much higher than than yeah. eastern oregon but um and the, the whole marijuana thing is actually oh. it, it turned out both of the lots were not buildable and so i was really worried about being able to sell them and um but they ended up within 24 hours i had a buyer and i was flooded with calls after that and it, it turns out that that zoning is like the only zoning that you can grow marijuana in so really? there's a lot of people. yeah um, so that's something I'm gonna have to probably get into some more because 
it seems like it's just a really hot market there. But. Dude, I love it. So I want, I want to break apart a few of those a few of those things you mentioned there. So um, you originally started in North Carolina and you, you mentioned you were using postcards at the start. I want to, I'm going to start to switch over to Oregon now because that's when things start to get consistent for you. Um, mm-hmm. So I remember having Gary Horton on. He's one of our carrot clients in San Diego. And mm-hmm. it sounds like you, can, you and him are using very similar methods, right? So yeah, he right, sends out... Yes. Yeah, and he sends out the offer, and he uses a lot of direct, direct mail to get the original seller. And then we're going to talk through, you know, how you, how you sell your properties. He talked through in detail how he does his. He started to use Google Pay Per Click about a year ago to get sellers through through Carrot now, which is working well for him. But let's kind of break apart this. So, number one, how do you how do you generate the lists to find the sellers to even mail to in the first place? Yeah, um, real quest. Okay. Is the, 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 um, and it's not back tax properties. It's just everybody. I've done a couple of things that have actually in my last few mailers that have really increased my results. Mm-hmm. I only mail people um, that don't live in the county that I'm mailing. Because oh. uh, I after I did like 30 deals, I started looking at them and nobody was in the same county. Hmm. And when I switched to doing that, I probably doubled my return and not nearly as many people call back and were upset about getting the offer. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's actually really that single thing has increased my yield quite a bit. But yeah, RealQuest is where I'm getting the data from. There's a couple other providers that are like uh, Data Tree and Title Pro 24 seven would be the other two places that I might use. Dude, one thing you mentioned was really smart, and uh, I was talking with Max Maxwell. He's a wholesaler out of North Carolina shoot, two weeks ago, and he was talking about where after his first two deals, he kind of he said, "Man, I reverse engineered the deals. I looked at the commonalities between those." And he was like, "Man, both of these deals kind of similar, like except he was looking for houses. They were, you know, they owed, they were back taxes. They were probates. They were whatever it was. Like he had like three things that." His first two deals matched. I was like, "What if I just go find more of those?" And mm-hmm. so he's increased his close ratio, his profits are better. He can become an expert in that side of things. And that's 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 smart. Uh, are there any other things you've noticed as you've gone? So you've got you're not really focused on the back tax thing. You've mm-hmm. got the per, someone who doesn't live in that county. Are there any other factors that are in common you're finding with your best deals? Um, not really. That I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I have pretty much focused on the lower uh, assessed value because it's hard to, with land, it's hard to um, value them appropriately when you're coming up with an actual contract. So, um, and that's something that Land Academy teaches and I've just stuck with it and and it's worked pretty well. So, um, but yeah, that's really the only other thing that I scrub for, I leave pretty much some people take out like large corporations. I pretty much leave everything in there. The Mm -hmm. only thing I take out is like, um, government, uh, entities that own land. Gotcha. And so as far as, as far as the location, like the boundaries, you mentioned some of your best deals are in a certain County in Oregon, which is around Mm -hmm. where Eugene is for people who aren't uh, familiar with, with Oregon very well. But are you, are you focusing more outside of cities? Of course, that wasn't outside much, but are you focusing way outside of cities? Are you focusing without or around cities? Kind of what's your strategy? Yeah, so I'm in uh, Mount, so there's pretty much all the counties across Eastern Oregon. The majority of my deals have been in Eastern Oregon, okay. um, way out in the middle of nowhere, Malheur, Harney, uh, Lake and Klamath counties. Yep. Um, and then Douglas, I've done, I did one deal actually right in Roseburg, pretty <laughs> small deal, but, mm-hmm. um, and then, and then Lane and Douglas, I want to get into Western Oregon more cause that's where all the trees are and the timber and that's what I want to be doing eventually. But, um, yeah, for whatever reason it, it works really well in Eastern Oregon and, and, uh, that's probably where I'll keep working largely. Mm-hmm. Um, just because it's worked so well in the past. But. The psychology behind that's pretty interesting, right? So if you, if you look at if you look at why that's working, there's a few things that pop up in my mind. I like to kind of riff back and forth with you on this. Where, you know, one of them is you mentioned it's out in the middle of nowhere. So there's probably not like it's probably not easy for someone who isn't used to marketing land like this to really know how to sell it because your average real estate agent isn't going to be jumping up and down to, to take that and list it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably a factor. Mm-hmm. 
So they're, they're, they're not going to be able to go to your average agent and sell it because it's probably way too low dollar. And what agent's going to want to be like, yeah, this landlocked piece of land way out in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, they just probably aren't savvy enough. They just they just don't know the process like you do to then list it on certain sites. And we'll go into that here in a bit and sell it. Um, mm-hmm. And part of it probably too, they've probably owned the property for quite some time, had some grand plans for it at some time, and now mm-hmm. can just use the cash and just cash out and, oh my gosh, here's an offer in front of me. I'd much rather take the thousand bucks or 800 bucks or whatever than not using this property anymore. Mm-hmm. Something like that. That's yeah. cool. So you you get the list, we talked about that, and then the direct mail piece, that's really that's really interesting. Gary mentioned that when he switched over that too, that that started, that, that started to work better. So you guys actually physically send them an offer in the mail, right? Like it's a typed yep. up contract. Yep, exactly. Mm-hmm. And they sign it and it, probably half the deals we do, um, some of the time I never even physically talk on the phone to the person, it's just mm-hmm. all via email or facts mm-hmm. yeah. that's wild man like when when you think about that especially coming from the house side of things right where everyone's mm-hmm. used to this negotiation back and forth do you guys have a lot of negotiation back and forth or is it pretty much they accept the offer and you're good yeah pretty much they either accept it or we're out typically uh-huh. yeah okay and what do you do yeah. like how do you come up with your offer price is there any sort of formula there based off of anything yeah usually when i get going in a county i um where I haven't done it in the past, I go to Zillow and Landwatch and find the lowest comp mm. uh, for that property size, and then I divide it by four, okay. and that's what I offer. Um, and then um, after I do a few deals, then you kind of get a feel for what works and what doesn't, and what you can sell them for, and mm-hmm. um, and then a lot of times I end up adjusting down, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that's kind of the, the general formula I use anyway. Cool, so you use those couple sites, Zillow and Landwatch, find the, the, the most recent comps, take that, mm-hmm. the lowest one, divide it by four, and then that way you know mm-hmm. you're going in with a strong a strong offer, and if you win it, then uh, mm-hmm. then you're dialed in. What, what kind of response rates are you getting? You send out 100 direct mail pieces, you know, what, what on average do you get back yeah. as far as win? Uh, usually, I think my numbers on the more recent mailers have been like one sold property per like 250 uh, offers that I send out. Okay, okay. So. And just working through some of the numbers. I, I love the number side of it, because then you can really like put legs to it, right? Once you once you kind of work the math side, you can go, okay, how do I scale, yeah. this, scale this puppy up? And uh-huh. I listened to this podcast you did on that, and that, yeah. Yeah, dude, it, it unlocks things so much because I know oftentimes we kind of, and I do this too, where you kind of use emotion to, to kind of figure out your marketing stuff, or maybe you just, you're not even using emotion, you just don't know your numbers well enough to then be confident to scale up. Mm-hmm. Um, so one closed contract, it sounds like per 250 offers that you send out, um, how much does it cost you per mailing piece to send out? So your total cost for 250. Um, about 50 cents, give or take a few cents, depending on how many I send out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, about 50 cents. Okay. So we're talking you know, 150 bucks, you know, roundabout, right around there, 125, 150 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what's your average profit per deal right now? Um, it's varied a lot. Like my best deal I made 10 grand on, um, one or two, like the North Carolina one, I've lost money on. Mm-hmm. Uh, my total cost to do a deal with a good good deal of buffer including like paying VAs and, yeah. and stuff everything that's associated with that property specifically not fixed costs is usually mm-hmm. about five hundred dollars so I I try to make at least a thousand dollars on a deal okay uh, and that's pretty consistent and then uh, a lot of them I make you know, one to four thousand per deal is pretty average sweet so that so that that right there makes it pretty cool because you can work those numbers back and see what you how you can ramp up on the pay, pay-per-click side of things so you can ramp up on the direct mail side of things and then mm-hmm. go from there which is cool so you send those out you start to get some people just mailing the contract back to you sign which is like crazy sounding to me yeah. it's so awesome like i'm trying to think of the psychology on the seller side of things where they get this contract and without even talking to someone they sign yeah. it and send it back there's no, there's usually no emotional connection whatsoever, I think is the deal. And a lot of times they've inherited it. They've never visited it in their life. And they're like, they don't really care. Like if someone's trying to scam them or not, probably they just um, don't want to 
about it. I think that's kind of what's going on. But yeah, I got gotcha. you. Um, and the cool thing is, man, like, uh, and this something I always, I'm always really passionate about getting people to lock into, you know, the service and the and like the, the the value that we're providing in our businesses. And with that, like, can you imagine that person's got a piece of land? they are getting no value from it right now and someone magically out of thin air sends them something and says hey this thing that's either been a burden or you haven't been thinking about i'm gonna pay you money for this thing like right now and you didn't have to do anything to do that like that's so cool and such a high value and you never know what that extra 800 bucks or 500 bucks or 2000 or 10,000, whatever it is is going to do for them in that moment and that's i think it's sweet dude that's awesome Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, so now you acquire the property. And just talk about the mechanics of that side of things, just for some people who may be used to the home seller side. So how does the property actually get get over to you ownership-wise when someone sent that back? Yeah, so they send it back, we do our due diligence, um, and then to actually close the deal, most of the time we end up talking to them on the phone, but to close the deal, we get a uh, mobile notary, Mm -hmm. and we send them uh, the new deed and they, and the check, uh, mm-hmm. for the property and they meet with the seller and notarize the deed hand the, um, the seller, the check and send us the deed and that's it. So it's cool. a really simple closing process. We do use title companies sometimes on larger deals or if there's title problems, but, mm-hmm. um, probably 70 to 80% of the deals we just do that way. Cool. So you just go find a mobile, mobile notary, get the, the deed and the check lined up, get it to them. They process it, make sure all set and get you guys a check and get you guys a deed or get them the check and the deed. Sweet. Okay. So now you've got the property, you own this property. You're buying, you know, like you mentioned, four, five, six, seven a month or so. Um, what do you then do with the property? How do you sell it? Um, so I, at the beginning, so I was using uh, talk about some of the value of carrot here. Mm-hmm. I was using lead propeller. Um, and I list all the properties on my website. I list them all on a list of websites, Zillow land watch. Um, and, and that all drives track traffic back to my website. Um, and I have a buyer's list. And when I was with lead propeller, I was only getting like one new, uh, buyer's list lead every week or mm-hmm. so. I don't know, maybe a couple of week. And then literally, with it, this didn't have anything to do with like posting more properties. When I switched to the carrot site, it was like three to five every day. <laughs> and I don't know what it was, what you guys are doing, but yeah, it was um, pretty dramatic like uh, difference. But um, so building my buyers list has turned into something that's really valuable because there's been probably five properties where I send it out to my, I email it out to my buyers list uh-huh. and within 24 hours, someone will buy the property. Dude, that's um, sweet. And the sale is very easy too because I just uh, they buy it online. They click a button, I create the deed and mail it to them. Um, so, are you doing like a PayPal link or something like that? Uh, Moon Clerk is what I'm using right now. Okay. Yeah, it's similar to PayPal. Cool, mm-hmm. dude. So I'm I'm in the back end of your account right now, and it shows 88 leads this week, and it's Thursday right now. So. <laughs> Uh, 88 leads this past week. Now, some of those are step one and step two probably. So in total new leads, whatever that is, I don't know, probably 60 or 70 or something like that. Um, but a lot of them are from cell phones. So 57% of those people came through in their cell phones, which that's, that's a pretty high percentage. You know, like if you're talking about house sellers or house buyers, usually that's in the 40s, maybe low 50s, 30%. So it looks like a lot of people are on their cell phones searching for properties. Um, and mm-hmm. on your site, or they went to Craigslist, or we're, we'll talk about where you're posting these here in a second. But let me kind of unpack uh, a little bit here. And this, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna be straight up like this is semi selfish reasons, but like something I'm really, really proud of too is mm-hmm. uh, is on that switch, right? So, this is something I learned years ago is one of the big lever points in our businesses is performance, is when we can pull some levers that increase the amount of results you get with the same input, then it really can dramatically increase your output. And Uh, The problem is so many people are always only focused on increasing more input, increasing more input, meaning like traffic, traffic, traffic. 
And one thing I've always focused on is like, what are those things that I can do on that website to build credibility, to hone in the conversion process, to truly understand at a psychology level what it takes to meet that prospect in their mind where they are, guide them in the process that, that they know that you're the one to work with, and then technically put put together a website that, that streamlines the flow of getting them in as a lead. And so you saw, I mean, I don't know what that percentage would be, but it sounds like in the thousands of percents of improvement on, on results. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say that that's kind of meant for your business? And also this follow-up question to that is, when you originally, and, and I originally started talking, I know there was some skepticism about like, possibly could it really produce that much more results? Mm-hmm. Talk about that a little bit, and then kind of what you saw after, you know? Yeah. Um so as far as what I feel like it, it is going to mean for the business, um, I mean, there's kind of two sides of it. There's my building my buyers list and then there's mm-hmm. getting leads, uh, which I haven't really dive, dove into much. I have closed a, le- a deal um, through just an organic Google search on my um, buyer site where people submit properties. But, mm-hmm. um, but uh, I mean, having that buyers list, I didn't really realize it at the beginning. It, I just kind of did it because it was on the website and I wanted to have a website to post my properties on. Mm-hmm. But it's turning out that it's, it's an incredibly valuable resource and having it just grow like that without me having to do anything, I think can, can really uh, be big in the future. Um, mm-hmm. And what was the other part of your question? It's kind of the skepticism, right? Because this is something that a lot of people will come to us where they see people like you on a podcast or they see people ranked well and talking about how Carrot works well, but they also see something that kind of looks similar, whether it's someone direct created their custom site or a competitor of ours like, like you were on. It kind of looks similar because they're trying to kind of emulate some things, but the performance isn't there. Like, So mm-hmm. what what was your mindset on like, were you skeptical, first of all, that just making the change could increase your leads? And then um, what was going through your mind before you made the decision and then after you started working with us? Yeah, so essentially I was, we had a certain amount of money to like build the business, but I was really trying to pinch pennies. And so even a $50 a month increase was something I really didn't want to have to do yep. unless I was going to get a result. And honestly, I mean, you were local, so that was kind of a big thing, but yeah. I may not have done it if you hadn't have, you know, uh, given me a deal. Yeah. Um, but, exactly. um, but, uh, you know, obviously, so basically I was trying to pinch pennies and it turned out that I probably should have done it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dude, I, I always love challenges like that because I'm like, oh man, he's already getting some sort of leads. If we can just like get him to do this, move him over here, I just, I'm just so passionate about it. I just know that he's gonna be a better result. And uh, I remember you came in and joined. You joined here on my computer, and then mm-hmm. you came back a couple weeks later. And we didn't do that many customizations on your site. I remember we kind of sat there for about an hour, and I walked you through some stuff and. We helped you get some really simple branding up there. You guys created a, a nice, simple, clean logo, and then we got a simple picture up there and made a couple adjustments, but there wasn't that much that we adjusted, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. to build this buyer's list, like I said, I'm looking at your account right now, there's 3,475 buyers. Some of those are step two, so it's probably around 3,000 unique buyers around there, between 2,500 and 3,000 unique buyers. The step two is our step two process for everyone listening to this, where we kind of further qualify that buyer, asking more questions. Um, so what do you do and actually build the buyer's list? Because they're coming from somewhere, so where are they coming from? Yeah. Honestly, I'm not doing a whole lot. I just post the properties and I make sure that the website is in, our website is in all of the ads. Mm -hmm. Um, Although I'll tell you one thing that I've found works really well is posting. I know, you know, there's paid advertising on Facebook, but we post our properties in Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. And when I do that um, and, and make sure it's in groups, large groups and, and post it in multiple groups. Um, I mean, we get like 20 or 30 leads a day uh, uh-huh. pretty easily when I just post a few properties. Uh, so that that's probably the biggest thing that I've kind of actively done to build the buyers list. But for the most part, we just post the properties on a bunch of different websites, make sure that the website's in there and that just drives traffic back mm-hmm. and and the website grows. So what are those, that. what are some of those sites? You mentioned some Facebook groups or are there specific sites or kind of your go-to I'm going to go here and post every time? 
Yeah, uh, we have a list of like eight probably different sites. Land and Farm, um, Landwatch, Zillow, um, Craigslist, uh, of course, Facebook. Um, I haven't really dove into social media on other platforms a whole lot. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, the website, buyer's list, uh, back page, a little, I do that. Um, but that's pretty much the main sites where I get the, the majority of buyers from. Cool. That's cool. I love it, dude. Like, so I'm just kind of bouncing around the back end and we start looking at some stuff. So you, you, you make some really good, I mean, they're simple, but really good listings, property listings on, on your carrot site. I'm looking at one right now. It's 15 acres in Malheur County for a hundred bucks down. Um, you sold it for 2,900. Uh, almost three grand. Do you remember kind of some of the scenario around that one about what you buy it for? You know, mm-hmm. um, kind of walk through that one if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. So the twenty nine hundred price is the cash price. We actually sold it for seventy two hundred. Sorry, there's an airplane going over. No, you're good. Man. Uh, <laughs> we so that was actually a really good deal. We bought it for five hundred um, and sold it for seventy two hundred on terms, a hundred dollars a month. Sweet. Uh, for 72 months. So hundred bucks down. So what, what happens in that scenario is if you, if you sell it and let's say, you know, 14 months in, they stop paying. Have you had a scenario where someone has done that yet? Mm-hmm. Uh, it was actually a Lane County property. Um, they essentially made the down payment, which is really small. I think it was even smaller than, a. um, it was just like dock fees and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then they never made any payments, period. And it went on for like five or six months. And um, and I got all the, the paperwork to send them certified mail to for close on. It's a land contract, so the deed stays in our name at mm-hmm. the county. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I think it's actually 30 days is, is how long. Uh, if they don't pay for 30 days, then we can for close on it. So uh, yeah, I just send them a series of letters that um, you know, notifies them mm-hmm. that they need your payments or we take it back with, you know, at X date. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dude, th- this, this, this is cool stuff. I, mean, I, I could talk for hours about this and about your entrepreneurial journey and stuff like that. And, um, man, the stuff you've been laying out here is the cool thing is it's, it's simple, right? I mean, it's not like this mm-hmm. isn't rocket science. It's you've got a formula, you're implementing it. Um, uh, man, it's so awesome that you're willing to share that with people. Now, the next thing is people actually have to go out there and execute, which mm-hmm. uh, which is kind of what separates the people who are making it happen versus who aren't. What's what's next for you guys, man? I know you're going to keep on churning some deals here. Kind of what, what's your what's your ultimate aspiration with this mm-hmm. business or just entrepreneurship in general? Yeah. So my goal is to have six thousand dollars of terms uh, money coming in every month. Mm hmm. Uh, once we have that, I'll probably largely stop doing my forestry consulting work mm-hmm. and just focus on the land business. And uh, long term, uh, like I said, I want to do timber deals. So um, that would be essentially buying uh, properties at a discounted price using the methods that I'm using and then uh, either keep keeping them long term as a passive uh, income investment. Mm-hmm. Um, or maybe flipping some of them. Um, so, you know, I, I just read uh, Jack Bosch's book and I love the interview you did with him, but uh, essentially I wanna do kind of what he talks about with timber properties and have, you know, my, you know, all of our income covered with passive income, but from timber properties, which is probably a little bit challenging because it's kind of a, a boomer bust thing mm-hmm. where you, you you do a timber harvest and it's a bunch of money and then, you know, it's a long time before you get another one. But that's, that's really our, our long-term goal is to have a large, uh, large timber property that we live on and do uh, sustainable forestry on it and, and have passive income from timber investments. Mm-hmm. I love it, man. I love it, dude. So, so when you guys, you guys are going to be back here in the next couple of weeks for Christmas and then you have some sort of a timeline when you, when you might head back out to the West coast uh, to live or what's, what's mm-hmm. the plan? Probably two or three years, something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't have like a specific date. I imagine it'll be a, a decent amount of back and forth. Um, we're gonna buy a property out there and and build a house on it is kind of our plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, probably a couple of years. 
Awesome, man. Well, dude, uh, I so appreciate you taking the time out to hop on the Carrot Cast with me. And I've been wanting to get this one in the books for a while because I, because <clears throat> I know it is just fun the way that we met, and also just kind of the challenge that I love that uh, we took on together. I'm like, oh man, let's get you some some better results, and and it's mm-hmm. always cool when it works out in your favor. So. Uh, yeah. Great stuff, dude. Uh, any parting words for people that are looking at land or even not even just looking at land, but let's say let's say they're possibly looking at carrot and they're on another platform where they built their own site. Is there any advice you, you'd give to someone in those scenarios? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. It's worth the, the extra money to go to carrot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Well, cool, dude. Uh, everyone, make sure you listen to this episode and then go back and listen to the episode with Gary Horton as well. Um, I think he was in the first 30 episodes or so, and he's also doing a very similar model to Luke, just in different states. I think he's in Texas, Arizona, California, hasn't branched up into Oregon uh, yet. But uh, just go listen to both those because in you know, the market that we're in, there's lots of options that people can, people can dive into and really provide value uh, for in the real estate market. And this is one, one part of the market that honestly a lot of people aren't looking at and there's just tons and tons and tons of these properties around i've got a friend joe mccall that he's got a good part of his business doing this right now in colorado and some other states so that's the thing there's just so much of this property all around that if you kind of find your farm area no pun intended but find your farm area get to know it and then just really start to go after and tackle it and, and help to get these properties out of people's hands that aren't getting value for them and getting people's hands who who are going to use them so luke keep crushing it, man. Uh, If you need any help, let us know. Looking forward to seeing you uh, sometime when you're out here. And uh, everyone, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the Carrot Cast. Give us a rating and review if you enjoyed this episode. And uh, if you're looking to buy some land in Oregon, head over to thefarmfinders.com. Get on Luke's list and buy up his land for sure. He'll he'll have some for you. Thanks, Luke. I appreciate it, man. Yep. Thanks for having me. For sure, dude. All right. See see y'all. Have a good week. 